Pleased to be here with Rabbi Dr. David Kasher, who is the associate rabbi at ICAR, non-denominational mega shul in LA, and um, is a really uh, profound philosopher and theologian and educator. And uh, it's been a privilege to have him as a chavruta for, for as a study partner for many years now. Yeah. So thanks for taking time to talk. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> so um, our topic today is mindfulness and mitzvah, a Jewish theory of, of consciousness. Uh, I guess my first question for you would be, Having done a doctorate in legal theory, uh, how did that impact your perspective on Jewish law itself? Mm, well, I mean, I, I, I could talk about things that I learned, like le certain legal theories, that, like legal realism that had like an influence on my thinking about Jewish law, but I think, I think it, it might be easier just to say that um, I was always interested in questions of like why why there is a law like what's what's the meaning of the law so like I'm at, I I got a doctorate in law but 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 it's actually all I spent my time doing legal philosophy and legal theory I'm actually not such a great legal thinker in Jewish law or American law like I I find it interesting but I I end up asking my my rabbis for like the answers in like matters of 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 law but I always I found myself interested in the in the big question, like what, why, what's the what's the meaning of the law? What's the value of the law? Why do we have law? Like, and and those questions are interesting in an American context. And then I think I've really um, I've really inevitably um, wanted to bring them back to the Jewish context. Like, well, what are the what's why mitzvot? Like, why do we have what's the point of mitzvot? So, being able to see those questions asked in a in a broader philosophical context ended up being very meaningful for, for taking a step back and thinking, wait, why do I do all this stuff? What, what, what do I think the point of it all is? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So what, what for you do you think is the point of mitzvah? What, what, what's the function of, of mm -hmm. the mitzvah? Um, very difficult question to answer um, on one foot. But um, look, I think there are, there are two uh, kind of major schools of thought on that. Um, simply put, there's sort of the rationalist and the the mystical, like the, the rationalist, maybe typified by, by, by Ramba, by mm -hmm. Maimonides, is that the mitzvot are all, they all have reasons, they're for the, the betterment of our lives. Like they were given to us so that we could live um, ethically, um, so we could live um, um, with health and order and flourishing, like they're, they make sense. Um, and that, that theory finds its way into certain schools of legal thought in, in, in Jewish law today, where the idea is that all the mitzvot are um, value principles. It's a way of implementing our values in the, in the world. Um, then on the other side, um, and this is really like kind of a, a mystical position, um, that all, the, mit, all of the, the mitzvot are just about doing God's will. And, and that, a less mystical version of it is... Um, is the philosopher Yeshayahu Leibovitz who, who put put it in those terms that it doesn't really matter um, what the what the commandment is. It's just like that you do it. Idolatrous to do it for reasons. Right. Right. Exactly. Like, like if submission. you're doing it for your own human needs, then that's actually that's not the point at all. Right. So is so is the system all about you know, rational precepts for our benefit, or is the system um, all, and, and even non-rational, but just sort of things, that values that we have, things that we like, or is the system just about a kind of um, either obedience or maybe even entering into some divine space? It's all religious. And I, I just think that that, that, that sort of like either or is really false to the Jewish system and the the, the rabbis themselves were pretty clear. There's a famous um, uh, section in the, in the tractate Yoma in the Talmud where they say that there are two kinds of mitzvot. There's chukim and mishpatim. There are the commandments that, as they say, um, even if we didn't have them, reason would dictate that you would come up with them. Those, so those are your, like, your thou shalt not kill, your thou shalt not steal, like things that just everybody knows that, the, that most societies have them. And, in a sense, we wouldn't really need the Torah, but of course the Torah is going to include them. And those, I think, are kind of value propositions. But then there's chukim. There's the, all these things that we do that we don't have any reason for doing, like, like keeping kosher. So a, a figure like Maimonides or his you know, inheritors would say, well, but I'm sure there's some reason, or maybe we don't know what the reason is. But, the, but the, this realm of law, I think of as the laws that we're doing 
just in order to, to have a religious experience. And that, that, um, that realm of law is the one that I think really um, is in, the, is in the, the realm of consciousness. It's about shaping consciousness. It's about like um, activating our, our, our consciousness, getting into a new state of consciousness. Mm-hmm. That's that, that so realm of law. So when many think of a religion and certainly religious law, I think the two primary filters used are um, the true and the good. Is this um, uh, epistemologically accurate? Is, does this actually represent a true manifestation of, of, um, of you know, of, uh, of reality? Um, or is this good? Is, is this the most ethically advanced system? What you're arguing for here is, is really a third category. And I wonder why more people don't look to religion for religious experience. Mm-hmm. They might look to spiritual circles for spiritual experience, yeah. right? I go to yoga, I go to meditation, I go on a hike, I do things that feel spiritually uplifting. But to look to religious community and religious ritual as a form of immersion within a consciousness where divinity flows or connects to the human yeah, experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. why do you think we don't see a bigger, a greater hunger for that or exploration of that? Or, or, or is that not your experience? Yeah, no, 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 yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the, the temptation or the yeah. tendency to put um, all of religious law into, really into one side or another, but let's say into like the rationalist or like, va- you know, val- va- human values um, framework, is really born out of like a discomfort with mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mystical experiences, with religious experiences, with anything, not just supernatural, but sort of like um, non-rational. And I think there's a discomfort with that, and so I think people from the Rambam on are trying to push it into, no, 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 this all makes sense. Um, but uh, but it's, also, it's also a mistake to put all of, um, all of religious law into the, into the pure, I don't, I don't think it's, it's I don't think most people are looking for a religion which is just all mystical experience or all religious um, submission. But I, I think you are also right to say that we are, at least in, I don't know, the com- yeah. communal circles we run in, we're, we've sort of lost that idea that, that mitzvah um, is uh, a kind of vehicle for... For, for consciousness, for, for, for the transformation of, of consciousness. There's a debate, actually, in the mm-hmm. Talmud, um, uh, whether mitzvot tzrichot kavanah, whether um, uh, doing a mitzvah requires full intention. Mm-hmm. And they go back and forth, and, you know, in the end, they concede, like, well, no, we can't, we can't require that, you know, full consciousness for every mitzvah, because we're just not capable of it. But it is an aspiration to bring consciousness, to bring thoughtfulness to, to mitzvah. And I would say that for some mitzvot, it's the whole point. It's like, it's about being in this in this space. Now I'm being kind of vague, but um, you know, you mentioned yoga. So I've been doing a lot of yoga lately, and there's this idea in, in yoga of alignment, right? Where you do these postures, and you want to get them just right. And um, and 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 in that sort of system of thought, the idea is that like if you get yourself into alignment, then you kind of transcend yourself and and enter some sort of like some some higher space, like alignment with like with the nature of reality, with the, with the, with the, with ultimately with, with God itself, right? And that's, you know, there's all, there's all sorts of um, ways, the systems of thought that suggest that a certain kind of directed intention, focused concentration can, can take you out of your own personal concerns and, um, and bring you into, um, something higher, like mm. you know, uh, the medieval uh, theologian spoke of the active intellect. Mm. Like there's this sort of divine mind, and by tapping your own mind into the divine mind, yeah. by thinking like high, elevated, pure thoughts, and for us that was Torah. By understand, like trying to align your mind with the Torah, that was like <coughs> getting into God's mind, mm. and by doing that, you transcend yourself. And there's something, there's some, like it is. It's if we don't have a- any. Um, language for that in our religious lives that we, re- we really have lost something. So similar, just like a yoga position, so too, like the performance of a mitzvah. Um, Rav Soloveitchik speaks, speaks this way a lot in his halachic man, like getting it just right and, and actually caring. It sometimes seems like to outsiders like so nitpicky, but just being really concerned about like, did I eat um, a date's worth of this or, a, or, a, or an egg's worth of this matzah? Like, and I have to be precise about it. It's like I've, I've lost... Um, 
my own personal concerns and worries and fears and anxieties and all the things that I think I need and want in life. And I'm just entering into another realm where I can just, I can just be fixed and focused on one. A lot of meditative life, meditation, is about just focusing on one thing so that you can um, lose your attachment mm-hmm. to all the, like, the particular things that are mm-hmm. pulling on us. So it's really, it's a way of, it's, it's, a, it's like a form of liberation. Right. And mitzvah can right. be that as well. Right. And some talk about that as their, it's, their, it's their avoda itself. It's the work itself to, as a channel to deeper connection, right? So, I mean, there's, there's the halakha that you can't um, make a shul a shortcut. You can't just pass through the shul. Mm-hmm. As if to say you can't make something wholly instrumental. And I think one of the greatest teachers of that in the 20th, 20th century, of course, is Buber. And this sense of the, moving from this I, it to I, thou, this sense that something matters enough that it can't just be exploited instrumentally for some other gain or that actually this encounter, this experience itself is so rich that don't extend it beyond here. And I think part of what you're saying is that we sometimes um, religiously underinvest in in the realm of experience and of rich consciousness. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole new avenue of putting deep, more spiritual depth into our religious lives. Yeah, I mean, I think I, th- I think that that that's well said, and I think that um, you're right to reference Buber and what Buber uh, is 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 ca- like call, calling upon from us is 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 presence. It's the idea of really being fully present. Like if if my religious life is only a means to an end, and it is sometimes, it's like I, I do these things so that I can create a better society. We have Buber admits we have to be in the I it relationship. Sometimes sometimes we're doing things in order to to manifest our values in the world. But sometimes we just we just want to be in this in this this relationship with mitzvah, which which actually becomes a relationship with God. And then like it, it, then it's about just tuning in and forget about what the mitzvah represents or does. It's just I'm just in it. I'm just in that space, and then, and then I can I have this opportunity to be fully present, to be fully present in my life, in my consciousness, and maybe fully present in my in my relationship with the divine. Yeah, you know. So, um, last question for you: um, what, What's your personal experience with this? Um, what does this look like for you personally? Have you had any meaningful experience with this? And uh, and or and or um, how might someone else kind of? Try this, if you will. If this is all uh, intriguing but foreign, mm-hmm. right? To some of this is obvious, right? Where you, you know, we started the whole conversation on kavana, but to others, it's it's really something new. So, how would you? How would someone kind of experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. experiment with this? Um, okay, well, okay. So, two 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 yeah. things that okay. come to mind. One is is sort of obvious, which is um, and which is shofar, the blowing of the shofar, and that's like that's an area where. They really do the, the, when they have this the debate yes, in the Talmud. Yes, right. This is like one of the primary um, uh, areas of Jewish law. Like, do you have to have intention when you hear the shofar? And 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 we all like we all know that on some level that's what and we all know. But like uh, when we hear the shofar, it it almost um, by its nature suggests that we should just be listening. Mm-hmm. And yes, you could be thinking about like. The, the uh, sacrifice of Isaac and the ram's horn that was there. You could be thinking about the things that you did wrong, repentance, a call to repentance. Yes, it, could, it, it, it does mean those things. It can mean those things. But I think I'll, I certainly, for myself, when I hear the shofar, I, for that moment, I'm just in, in the listening. Right. Just, just hearing the sound of the shofar, that's all I'm thinking about. Like, yeah. just really bringing that into myself. Yeah. And just, that's a moment of presence that I, like, I rarely have throughout the yeah, course of right. the year. You know, it's interesting, I'm just before you go on, uh, Rosenzweig, the great Jewish existentialist, it's so interesting that such a, um, such a deep thinker, critical thinker, um, could point to a Yom Kippur religious experience as what's transformational for him to choose to remain Jewish instead of converting to Christianity, mm-hmm. right? That it wasn't that some drusha, some sermon he heard there or some profound lesson, it was actually just being in that space and allowing to, and I think sometimes the cognitive, as you're touching on, the cognitive can really block that experience. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I hear shofar and I'm like, which of these eight meanings am I thinking about right now? Is this an alarm clock? Is this a cry? Yeah, right? yeah. I'm thinking about the different types legally of how it sounds. And actually to kind of turn off the mind a little bit yeah. uh, in that wrong space. But anyways, I cut you off. No, no, I think, I think, I think you're right. And I think, look, there, there are other um, 
debates that yeah. this touches, not even a debate, but you know, I often think of, we went to rabbinical school yeah. together, and I often think that like there were people there, there were like the, the, the justice guys, and then there were like the God guys. I mean, they were all guys in our rabbinical school, but, but, but right there, the, there were the people who were there because they wanted to, to use Judaism to build a better world, and that's a great thing to do. And then there were people who were there in, in, in any religious setting because they just, they just want to fe- like feel this, this thing, that what is God? Like they want to have that experience. And both of those things are, you don't choose between them. Those are both fundamental pieces of, of, of the Jewish religious model. But I think that, um, that mitzvah, um, our, our commandments, um, are, are also in service of both of those, right? There's not one or the, you don't, you don't only have the divine experience when you meditate. You also, um, or, or maybe a better way to say it is that the, the mitzvot can be a form of, of meditation, right, right. right? The mitzvot can tap you in to that sort of, it, you keep using the word experiential, mm-hmm. that sort of experiential religious mm-hmm. life. You know? Done not through just the mind, but through action. It's, it's, it's right. a meditative practice. If you right, it's that. a little bit, like I said, those, yeah. those poses, those like yeah. asanas and yeah. yoga, like where you just get into the pose and you're just there and do you get it just right? And by the way, are those poses yeah. The, in yoga, are they the the true poses that it's, bring you into right. the divine? I don't know, right. but they are a way of they're a system that like that has a lot of benefit, a lot of practical value, but also just like it's about hitting that right note, about mm-hmm. getting. And so too with mitzvah, like we could have a different debate about like, well, are are all these mitzvot exactly God's will and the way that we carry them out in rabbinic interpretation? But sometimes you just have to be in the like just doing it and trying to do it precisely and the precision itself, the alignment yeah, itself yeah, yeah, um, is, is, it brings you somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, I wanted you ask yeah. one other thing, yes. which is oh, to yeah, give good, good. people an example. Please do, yeah. And I, the one thing I would yeah. say is that like, it's really, um, I think it's really worthwhile to like pick a mitzvah that's sort of yeah. like your mitzvah. Right. And I would say, um, maybe pick one that's yeah. kind of arbitrary. Be- like I find that with myself for reasons I don't, I don't fully understand that all the, the mitzvot around like my hands and feet, mm. like my, so for some reason like washing my hands in the morning or like there's a certain way that you cut your fingernails in Jewish life. Like this doesn't seem like it manifests a particular value or maybe it's like some people would say it's inherited from superstitions or, but like just being in the like, oh, I'm just doing this just, um, the way you put your shoes on in the morning. Mm-hmm. There's like a ritual way of putting your shoes on in the morning. And I, you know, I do that before I leave the house in, in the morning. And, and it's just a moment of centering, of just being like right foot, left foot, then tie left foot, then tie. And it's just like, just being in that, in that sort of meditative space of like, I'm doing the thing. I'm in the, mm-hmm. I'm in alignment with the mm-hmm. thing. And that's a moment where suddenly I'm not thinking about everything that's confronting me in the day and everything that I'm worried about in my life, but I'm just, I'm in the mitzvah. I, I achieve, just for a moment, I achieve that consciousness. So I would encourage that to people. It's like, find, find a mitzvah and maybe even not the most um, grand and, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and virtuous one, but just like one that sort of speaks to you and try and like to, to figure out what it's like to really be in that mitzvah, yeah. to really do it with, with precision and with concentration and... Um, and and with with care and own it like own that yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting like the misnagdish world for so long was all about kind of the the, the breadth of the system the, the entirety of the system and the Hasidic world kind of emerged as like the depth of the individual act mm. you know which added so much in it and I think you know Rav <laughs> Chaim Vital talks about in reincarnation that every neshama every soul is returning for the mitzvot they haven't yet completed mm. in a sense to figure that out and another opportunity around the mitzvah you said is that when someone passes away. We normally point to saying Kaddish, which is beautiful, and we point to maybe doing some learning in their honor, which is beautiful, but there's the opportunity to take on a mitzvah in their memory. Um, it's another opportunity to really, you know, pick one and own it. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned Ch- um, Hasidus, and like, you know, I think this is one of the things Chabad is so good at. Like, you know, they're out there just trying to get people to do mitzvot, and some people deride that and say like, oh, that's, that's what's gonna bring the Messiah, is like, you know, why not do like real action in the world? And uh, listen, I, I, I work at a shul where we do real action in the world and I believe in that. But like Chabad's got something too, which is to say, it's not just like checking the boxes. It's like getting people to be in that space of consciousness, you know? It's like doing these, these things like lighting Shabbat candles or like just like being focused and aware. And then, and then maybe that does bring about a messianic consciousness. Mm-hmm. Maybe it does. Maybe if we all have moments of attunement and alignment like maybe that will create uh, a more um, functional 
um, flourishing, breathable, happy society, mm. you know? And one way or another, I think, I think it is one of the pathways yeah. to an encounter with the divine. Right, beautiful, you know? beautiful. Yeah. So uh, don't worry, you can learn more Rabbi David Kasher's Torah on Ikar website and on Parshanut. Thanks so much.